Totalitarianism. It's a word that captures the worst of the 20th century, the cost of millions of human lives on behalf of a governmental system. In the 1950s, Hannah Arendt, a prominent philosopher at the time, was a woman who thought intensively about the nature of totalitarianism, and later identified that there is but one thing necessary for a totalitarian regime to have success. A thing that in fact also explained why, after thousands of years of political activity and social contentions, that totalitarianism has only just appeared in the 20th century. Dr. Arendt explains that this thing was a dynamic. A dynamic of isolation and loneliness. But before we can elaborate on what Dr. Arendt said about each, it's important to understand the governmental system that exploits it, totalitarianism, to then see and appreciate how it's only just now that it's made an appearance in the 20th century. And in turn, we'll also see how psychological control by the government has played such a crucial role in that fact. So here we go. The Genesis of Totalitarianism. In her book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, published in 1951, Arendt piggybacks off what the Greeks had cataloged back in the day regarding forms of government. According to Plato, these are the ones that humanity had tried out. Democracy, a government by the brave. Aristocracy, a government by the best. Oligarchy, a government by the rich. Democracy, government by the people. And tyranny, a government by one. Aristocracy is our obvious choice. This means that the best or most competent individuals get selected to the top. And democracy is probably the rarest form, but it was exemplified through Sparta and her politics. Same with the Vikings in Scandinavia, but less so. In the US today, we'd have what you call a hybrid model. Some blend between an oligarchy and a democracy. With the caveat of our democracy being a constitutional representation of the people, not a raw democracy. Okay, but now hold on. Where is totalitarianism? Well, this was Arendt's point. It didn't make Plato's list because it had yet to be conceived and carried out by humans. So when did it actually show up then? If you remember, Arendt makes the case that it was a manifestation of the 20th century. In her book, she points out two concrete examples, Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia. It's then that she distinguishes totalitarianism through these following characteristics. Number one, totalitarianism erases classes by seeing everyone belonging to the masses. Number two, totalitarianism shifts power and authority from the military to the police. Number three, totalitarianism engages in world domination. And number four, totalitarianism seeks to align its efforts to a supreme, unavoidable law. With the Nazis, for example, the unavoidable law was grounded in nature, which was supposedly issuing the dominance of one master race and exterminating all others. For the Bolsheviks, on the other hand, the law was grounded in history, capital H history. But in either case, it was an inevitable moment of reality that dictated their actions. Okay, but here's another question. How does one get thousands upon thousands to follow in these actions? Dr. Arendt pointed out that it was ideology, that totalitarian regimes can only prevail if the masses are able to accept a grand narrative transcending a face value understanding of reality. She wrote, Ideological thinking becomes emancipated from the reality that we perceive with our five senses and insists on a truer reality concealed behind all perceptible things. So to clarify, basically an ideology is what happens when you get people trying to convince other people of something that can't be scientifically proven, something that can't be detected by our five senses, our smelling, touch, taste, hearing, our sight, and not only do they try to convince us of that metaphysical reality or God, but they do so believing with such fervor that it can't possibly be otherwise. Dr. Arendt also contends that ideological thinking becomes more common when the lines between fact and fiction get blurred, when the truth becomes more subjective than objective in a society. Now, here's where we get to the part in her theory that justifies my introduction to this video. Here's where we get to the dynamic of isolation and loneliness. Dr. Arendt tells us that loneliness in the political sphere amounts to loneliness in the social sphere. It goes something like the phenomena of cancel culture. Just imagine, for instance, you know or knew a victim of cancel culture, how their cancellation alienated them for breaking codes in our political language games. And as a consequence, for fear of further association with them rubbing off a similar fate on you, you broke ties with them and in all likelihood, every other person they knew felt the same and did the same, except for maybe their mom. Thus, they became socially alienated, which then allows us to reason that banishment on a political front is the same thing as banishment on a social front. 
Moreover, it's been long determined that loneliness is not the same thing as solitude. Dr. Arendt shows that it was first outlined by Cicero in his De Repubblica and then further delineated by the Stoic Epictetus in his discourses, writing that one is not in company merely by being among company, and that just because one is alone does not mean he is solitary, but is instead together with himself. And indeed, loneliness is a devastating reality, and leads many to mental instability and even suicide, while solitude, on the other hand, can be a highly productive and creative state. But now remember that Dr. Aaron's conviction was that a totalitarian regime cannot thrive unless the classes turn into masses, a consequence of mindlessly accepting an ideology or grand narrative with little to no resistance. And now, more to Aaron's punchline, the way that people get other people to mindlessly accept an ideology is to make sure that they're lonely. And so what better way to do that than to make everyone avoid solitude? And this is what Dr. Arendt was keenly aware of. She knew that solitude was the gateway to individual and creative thought, making it the last thing that a totalitarian organization wanted from the people they sought to govern. And so to reduce individual solitude, what totalitarian governments do is double down on trying to make us into lonely people, to break the ties between us, the networks that have us belong to a healthy social unit so that all that's left is this blob of lonely made people, a mess of one individual laced in and over another, fusing ultimately into a non-thinking mass. What prepares men for totalitarian domination in the non-totalitarian world is the fact that loneliness, once a borderline experience usually suffered in certain marginal social conditions like old age, has become an everyday experience of the ever-growing masses of our century. Hannah Orant